Okay, and we are live. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for a new session on the Book Reading Club. Today, we're going to start with a new book, Java 9 Modularity uh, by Sam and Paul. Um, so please, and we also have Ivan here with, with us, as you know, uh, one of my colleagues uh, that helped me run the Book Reading Club. So before we go into the, the session itself, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Paul and um, Sam to introduce themselves, please. Sure, sure. Tony, you kick it off. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is uh, Sander Mack. I'm uh, from the Netherlands, and I work at uh, Luminous in the Netherlands, which is a software technology company. I work there as a uh, software architect and uh, have been involved in uh, product development and doing projects for clients as well. Um, quite some experience using OCI as a modular technology, and that also sparked uh, my, and I can also speak a little bit for Paul there, our interest into Java 9 and what happened there. And we got in a bit too deep, you could say, and uh, we ended up writing a book, book about it. So that's, uh, that's uh, my backstory. My name is Paul. Um, I'm also working from the Netherlands, but I'm living in the Bay Area uh, for almost a year now. Um, working with Netflix. Um, and a few years back, I wrote a book about OGI after um, getting a little bit too deep in OGI first. And um, then a few years later, Java 9 came around and um, started talking about Sunderwell. Uh, maybe we should write a book about that as well. Um, so we ended up doing that. And um, well, here we are. Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us and to uh, have some of your time to uh, share some of your experience with us on Java 9. Um, so before we actually start, uh, let me share these with our viewers as well. Uh, as you know, this is going to be a Q&A uh, session most of the time. So hopefully, you read some of the book. So for the first session, we're going to review the first uh, four chapters of the book. Uh, is that right, Ivan? Actually, it will be six chapters. Oh, six chapters, yeah. yeah. Um, can you can name them yeah. for us? Yeah, it's modularity matters, the first chapter. Then modules and the modular JDK. Then working with modules. Then services. Then modularity patterns. And finally, additional modularity patterns. So these are the first six chapters of the book, which basically comprise the first half of the book. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully you you have a good grasp on, on the book uh, and read a little bit about it. Uh, I'm just going to take uh, the chance to uh, if uh, Paul and and um, doesn't mind, let me so let me just share the screen. I guess that you guys don't mind if I also uh, share this with the audience. So sure. um, Paul and Sander, they came up with this uh, website, childmodularity.com, which has all the resources for the book. So unfortunately, we're not able to grab an O'Reilly uh, discount code for you guys, but you definitely can grab the book from uh, uh, Sander and Paul website. Um, anyway, so for you for you guys to post the questions, please, please, you can go to virtualjug.com uh, website, and you'll grab uh, a link over there to join us on the Slack channel. On the Slack channel, there is um, this channel called uh, Live Session, and you're able to post any questions that uh, you want over there about the book. And I'll be happy to relay that to Sander and Paul. Um, another, another, another possibility, you can just post the question directly on the uh, live chat on the YouTube channel, and we are happy to relay that as well. So uh, introduction done. Um, rules are, in, are set as well. So let's let's start and dive in into uh, into our session. So one of the things I always ask to our authors, uh, the first question that I that I do to our authors when we start a new book is, what was your motivation to uh, to write the book? Why why did you come up with the with the, the Java modularity book? Okay, so I can uh, take that on, and maybe uh, Paul can uh, amend if I forget something. But uh, like I said. Uh, when we're working at Luminous, we build a lot of products. And when you're building products, your mindset is quite different when, than when you're working as a consultant and you're going from a single project to a next project, etc. And what we notice is that if you build products, you have a very long horizon. Uh, you want to make sure that your application is still maintainable, understandable, extensible, um, even after three, five, maybe 10 years. 
And uh, that's a really hard and tough thing to, um, to do. So you architect for that. And one of the most important principles when architecting for long-term uh, stability, extensibility, and maintainability, in our opinion, is modularity. So um, like I said, we uh, chose OGI because it was mainly uh, yeah, one of the single uh, modularity frameworks that was available for Java to do so. And then Java 9 came along and Jigsaw was going to come out in Java 9. Uh, at least that's what we all hoped, and it eventually en ended up there. So that's, um, that hope uh, at least uh, was right. Um, but that also raised the question for us, okay, wh what are we going to do? Uh, obviously, we needed to dive into Java 9 and uh, the module system and see what it's all about. And uh, then the question, of, co of course, is, is this something that we should adopt and shouldn't adopt? And this led us to, uh, to do a lot of research, uh, also to do some uh, conference talks about that. And actually, the conference talks led to some discussions with O'Reilly. And um, yeah, from one thing to the other, uh, uh, we ended up with a book deal, book deal at O'Reilly to uh, sort of uh, yeah, create a, a reference manual for creating modular applications using Java 9. And uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, for us, the, the, the driving reason is not so much um, um, that we wanted to uh, write a book about Java 9. And we really want to focus on modularity as a principle. So uh, Paul already said he, he wrote a book about uh, OSGI as well. Uh, also, again, not just because it's a, a cool or hip technology, because it isn't, but because it's an important technology to actually create maintainable applications. Cool. Uh, yeah, for me, actually, before OSGI, it already kind of started as, as a general interest in uh, how can you create more extensible applications. And I, I think I've played around with like 30 different solutions that I created myself with class loaders and and um, you can drop in jar files and things like that. Of course, it never worked properly, but I was always playing around with it. Um, so when I first got my hands on OGI uh, after, after I joined uh, Luminous, um, I got super excited about it. And I was like, wait, well, this is finally the solution I've been looking for for all these years. And uh, this gives a way to, to do that kind of um, extensibility. Uh, so that's also why I got really deep into it, wrote a book about it, then decided, oh, dude, I'm never going to do a book again because it's just, it's too much work. Um, but then Java 9 came around, started talking to Sander, and he was like, I'm thinking about writing a book for O'Reilly about this thing. And I'm like, all right, let's do it again. <laughs> so um, that's about it. Okay, very well. Uh, yeah, I know I know Paul from, from his uh, early times when he was experimenting with JBoss Forge uh, <laughs> together with me. <laughs> uh, yep. And yeah, I've seen you guys uh, talk about uh, modularity, not only about OSGI, but also uh, in JavaScript modularity. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I know what you mean by having experience in modularity. Uh, your first your first chapter is called, the, the chapter of the, the first chapter of the book is called Modularity Matters. So why does modularity matter? Um, for me, that's really about maintainability. Um, I think if you've been along, uh, around long enough in, in writing software, you've always experienced that even if you write code yourself and you're super excited about it and um, you, did, you did the best job you ever did um, designing that code, looking at it a year later, you're like, I don't know what to do with this. And you make changes and stuff breaks breaks in unexpected places. And that's not a good experience. And um, that is usually, well, one of the main reasons that that happens is um, you have tangled code. Um, you change something on one side of the system, something falls over on the other side of the system, and that just shouldn't happen. And that's because you didn't have clear boundaries uh, between different parts of your system, between different parts of your modules. and. Um, kind of preventing that problem and designing um, for longer term maintainability and extensibility. So you want to add some some new feature and how do you do that without touching all the other code that you already have? Um, that's what modularity gives you. So I think that's, that's for me the most important reason. Yeah. I also think it's important to add that, I mean, modularity is not, it's not a technology question. It's really an architectural principle and I mean, you could even do all the stuff that we write about in the book before Java 9. If you're really um, strict in your coding, if you really know what you're doing and you have the, the guidelines in place, et cetera, it's just that 
with a module system, uh, you get so much more help from your tools and from your, uh, in this case, Java compiler, virtual machine, etc., to help you uh, maintain these boundaries and to help you uh, yeah, maintain these modules. And it's not that this is completely new, that you couldn't do this before. It's just that tools allow you to do it much more effortlessly. OK, cool. So dear audience, <laughs> you may ask your questions in the Slack channel, in the live session channel, or in the group chat here in, in YouTube. Yeah, right now we, we don't have anything. We're still in the, the start. Uh, so please, Ivan, proceed with your next question. OK. Uh, and going to the to the meat of the book, the second chapter, which is modules and the modular JDK. My next question is: uh, Java nine introduced modularity with Project Jigsaw, or actually, Project Jigsaw did something else uh, besides uh, pure modularity. But anyway, uh, if if we take the evolutionary versus revolutionary separation of Java releases that uh, Mark Reinhold uh, tries to always talks about at conferences. Uh, would you consider Java 9 as uh, revolutionary because of the introduced modularity or not that much? Um, I think you're uh, revolutionary. Re 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 um, um, potentially, it's the biggest chance that we've ever seen in, in the Java platform. Um, of course, you can say, well, you can just ignore everything about modules in Java 9 and just continue using it as you did in, in Java 8 and Java 7 and, and the older versions. And in that case, it would be a very small, not very exciting release. But if you do look at modules, it's the biggest thing uh, ever. Maybe not the most exciting thing, but it's the biggest chance. OK. So you think it's revolutionary? Great. <laughs> uh, and as you as you wrote, uh, some kind of modularity was already uh, introduced with uh, JDK eight and Java eight and the compact profiles. Uh, but have you ever seen uh, any of them being used in a productive application, either in your projects or somewhere? Yeah. Well, I know for sure that I didn't use them in any projects. And actually, I'm not really aware of, of how and where they were used. I think one of the downsides of the um, uh, compare profiles were that uh, they were implemented in the Java 8 embedded uh, version. So uh, mainly targeted at ARM uh, platforms. So that's already something well, that we don't do very much with. And uh, I think it was also a version that you had to license from Oracle. So uh, uh, not as free as OpenJDK uh, proper, so to say. Besides that, um, it was just not flexible enough. Um, I, I think it always, if, if you do anything enterprisey like, like not, not something specifically embedded, uh, then you always end up needing the whole thing anyway. So um, because you just miss the flexibility of um, just having just the things that you need, you always end up needing that one API that is not in one of the compact profiles, which means that you have to um, to start using the whole thing. OK. OK. So we got one, uh, one of the first questions from the, from the audience. Uh, this is more like a comment that uh, I would like uh, Paul and Sanders to give their thoughts about. I'm going to try, it's kind of like long. This is coming from Saif. Mm -hmm. And basically, he says, as per my understanding, Java 9 modularity is a way of thinking more than new features. I feel like it's going to take time to adopt in the Java community, especially in the case of a complicated platform. I also feel like you're targeting architect level in the book. I'm excited about technology for sure, but I feel handcuffed as a dev. Uh, as you know, I can learn it. Uh, play with it, but it's going to take time to move on. Um, do you guys have any comments about this? Yeah, so I totally agree that it will take a considerable amount of time before the uh, community really um, uh, grasps the, the impact of modules, modularity, and everything around it. And uh, as for now, I mean, you can still keep using Java 9 without modules, and probably uh, they will never be 
requires. I think uh, Java will always have backward compatibility with GlassPath, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, but still, uh, this is one of the reasons why we wrote the book, right? It's, it's not a feature that you can learn in an afternoon and then start using it everywhere. It's something mm -hmm. that really affects your architecture. It really affects um, yeah, the whole setup of your application, the whole way of thinking, uh, as the comment indeed says. So I agree, this, this needs a lot of time to bake in the community. Um, we're now seeing that library maintainers, for example, are starting to, um, uh, to check out modules and see what it means for their library to be published as a module. And um, uh, yeah, so this is really something that it won't happen overnight. And um, I'm not really sure whether I understand the, the, the comments about being handcuffed. So I'm, I can't comment on that, but um, I do agree that it will take a long time before this will be fully integrated into the Java community. So another way to look at it, um, there's also a, an opportunity um, right now to kind of help out library authors and framework, framework maintainers to actually um, make 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 those frameworks that you're excited about compatible with modules. Um, it's it can be a lot of work. Uh, not everyone is already uh, deep into into the module system. So if, if you are excited about it, uh, definitely start helping those open source projects out and um, move the ecosystem forward. Uh, because for sure, it, it does need some time before all the libraries and all the frameworks are uh, properly compatible or um, supporting modules um, very well. Yeah, I will, I will say that uh, looking into the contact, I will say the handcuffed comment was about uh taking time and then that the, the platform, well, not the platform, but the library is going to take some time to be compatible with modules. So mm -hmm. if you want to have, probably if you want to build like a full modularized platform or architecture on your uh, system, uh, you're still going to have to wait a little while until you have all the libraries that you require to have them model, right? Yeah. Well, fortunately, there, there are some migration aids here. And um, this is mainly the focus of the second part of the book. Uh, so we won't get too much into that now. But um, things like automatic modules are really meant to help in this transition period where, well, yeah, not every library is available as a module yet. Sure. Uh, we do have another question here. It's not probably, not, I don't think it's related with what we were discussing, but uh, I find it kind of interesting. I'm not sure if you guys, I, I definitely not, 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 don't know the answer about, on this, but Duke on Slack is asking, why doesn't Java 9 has a, doesn't run on 32-bit platforms like ARM and IR3x6? Yeah, that's a good question because I had a discussion with someone a couple of weeks ago about that. and. Uh, there were builds for Java 9 for 32-bit platforms, um, but uh, at release, those have been pulled. And I'm not sure why. Um, apparently, Oracle doesn't want to take responsibility for that, doesn't want to support that anymore. Uh, that could be it. Uh, but it's a bit strange. Um, but the uh, Azul guys, who also provide OpenJDK builds, um, they do have 32-bit uh, builds, at least for Java 8. And I think, uh, there's an assumption, but I think they're working on builds for 32-bit ARM for uh, Java 9 as well. So if you need that, uh, that's definitely the place to look. But I'm not sure why, why Oracle decided to pull this. They, they haven't really communicated anything uh, openly about that. OK, thank you. Um... Yeah, Ivan, can you proceed with your next question, please? Sure, sure. Uh, now, a little bit specific question, more concrete. Uh, so, suppose I have a I have a module, uh, and there I have an exported package, and uh, inside this exported package, I have a class with a protected method. Uh, so, can I extend this class and uh, overwrite? this protected method uh, from a class which lies in a different uh, module? And if yes, do you consider that as a, as a bad practice? Uh, I mean, using and exporting protected methods? Um, I repeat my question again? No, yeah, I'm just, just, um, just checking if I got a question right. I would think so. So um, I'm saying I have a protected, or maybe even a private class, and I put it in an exported package. Correct? 
Uh, yeah, I have a class with the protected methods, right? And I put it in an export package. Yeah, so you, you can absolutely do that. You can even put a private class in an exported package. Um, so if one module can read another package because it's exported, um, after that, the normal rules that we already had in previous Java versions apply. So that means if um, a class is uh, private and it's exported, um, I, I can't effectively use that class because it's private and previously I couldn't uh, see it and that means I still can't see it. So when it comes to the module system, I have access to that class, but um, then the other rules kick in and I still can't do anything with it. So that the same is for uh, for protected, which is a little bit more complicated, but, but the same rules apply. If I can read it um, with the module rules, the old rules apply. Yeah, so I think the example that Ethan posted was that if you have a public class with a protected method and some other module reads this class from the exported package, then you can extend this class, I think, in the other module and override the protected method. That's 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 perfectly possible because it follows the rules, like uh, like Paul said, just of normal Java accessibility. Yeah. yeah. And do you, do you consider this as a bad practice? Would you would you do it, or would you put protected methods in a in an API where which you can? Um, yeah. Well, so I think um, not necessarily a bad practice, but um, Providing classes to be extended as an API is sort of, yeah, you can do it, but we're more favoring composition over uh, over uh, uh, inheritance in general. So uh, in that sense, I would say um, I, I wouldn't necessarily um, uh, grasp this solution uh, as a first solution. Okay, it's not necessarily a bad, bad practice anyway. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a, another question here uh, from Slack. This is coming from uh, Ramesh. So basically asking if module A requires B and B requires C, uh, can module A able to read C? Uh, depends. Um, you have two different kinds of, uh, of, you even have more than two different kinds, but you have different kinds of require statements in modules. So if module A uh, requires B and module B requires transitive module C, then module A can read whatever is exported from module C, but only if, if module B declares its dependency as being transitive, um, which effectively means that whatever is exported from uh, uh, module C is also part of what is uh, readable from module B. If it's a normal require statement, so uh, A requires B and B requires C, uh, then uh, then it's not possible to to actually read any uh, classes that are exported from uh, C in A. So typically, you would use a requires transitive if um, you're using types from that other module in your own API. Yeah, because then anyone who is using your module. They they will effectively also need the other module. Otherwise, otherwise the API will not even um, be usable. Um, if that's not a case, then typically you do not want to require transitive because you're just pulling in more dependencies that um, your users users um, shouldn't directly depend on. Okay. Yeah. I hope it's clear without pictures, but there are pictures about this in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah we we'll, we'll probably, probably require like a whiteboard over here. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, here's another one. This is from Carlos. Uh, in a typical Java e application and in some libraries, packaging by layers is a predominant design pattern. How can, how can modularity help design our packages by feature and contracts with design by layers? Um, so this would be a question, how do you want to split up um, the different parts of your source code. And um, traditionally in Java E, and not, not specific to Java E, but just that, that type of application, doesn't matter what technology exactly you use. But um, kind of the old way of doing things was uh, split it by kind of technology. So you have a data layer, you have a web layer, um, maybe something in between. Um, and then 
all the code with all the features access ends, ends up in that same layer. And you kind of treat that layer as, as a module almost. Um, so first of all, you could do the same thing by actually making that a module. Um, but then I would go beyond that. And actually, that's not even related to modules. But um, I think it's kind of a bad practice to just split code bases um, based on technology. So put all your data access code together. I would say also split it by features. So um, if you have um, a super simple example, if you would have books and authors, um, you should probably not put them in the same data access um, interface. Uh, and that means they can be in different modules now. Um, but even without modules, you should probably split those and you should not put those in the same um, API and um, just treat it as one big thing. Um, that's just a bad practice. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Next question coming from Saif. Uh, this is probably a little more related with the part two, but still. Um, did you have the chance to migrate one of your apps from Java eight to nine? Uh, was it painful? Uh, what kind of issues can you can you face? Um, so I've I've worked a lot on. Um, mostly experimenting with um, with migrations. That was mostly preparation for the book and all the presentations that we've been doing. Uh, so I've migrated a whole bunch of apps using different technology stacks um, that include Spring and Hibernate as used in the book. Um, I've done uh, some Juice and some Furdex uh, recently. I, I, I wrote a blog post about that. Um, I have to admit that I've, I haven't actually migrated anything real yet. I, I didn't do any let's say, work-related stuff, uh, migrations yet. Uh, but it's definitely on my planning for um, the coming months. Um, so I'm, I'm seriously looking at that. Uh, the challenges there are that um, if I look at, at my production applications here, um, there's just there's a lot of dependencies in many cases. And um, you can almost guarantee that one of those dependencies um, will have some kind of problem, maybe a split package, um, maybe some other incompatibility um, with, with, with a module system. And if you have that many dependencies, um, you're kind of setting yourself up uh, for trouble. Um, so that might be painful, but the way I'm going to approach it is um, first try to kind of start with, with almost a clean slate, um, clean up as much as possible, because that needs to happen anyway, and then uh, start, start moving towards uh, proper modules. Yeah. So I think it's important to make a distinction between migrating to Java 9 and migrating to Java 9 with modules. Um, so for the second part, um, uh, no real world experience yet because the applications, the products that I work on are all OCI based and we're not going to throw away uh, this whole OCI based code base uh, just to start over again using Java 9 modules. Uh, but with the migration to, to Java 9 itself, um, I think the main issues that you run in there uh, we'll run into is that um, uh, encapsulation kicks in for uh, for uh, JDK internal types. And if you're just using the class path, then this will be a warning uh, on your console. And uh, well, that might be unexpected, but uh, it's not too bad. Uh, but if you're in the module world, then this will turn into uh, a real problem because you can't re uh, really access those encapsulated types anymore from the from the uh, module world. So we'll need to have to uh, replace those calls with any calls uh, that are publicly supported, public su publicly supported API. And the other big thing that they did is that um, um, uh, in Java SE, there are five or six um, modules now that are actually sort of um, uh, EE modules. So containing things like uh, Corba and uh, web services stack and uh, XML uh, uh, stack, etc. And these uh, are now not available by default on the class path anymore. So for example, if you migrate a Spring application, you'll definitely run into the fact that uh, it uses uh, uh, those XML types, for example. And you will have to add this module uh, to the JVM itself. Even if you're not using modules for your application, if you're just running code from the class path, when it uses those types from JDK, you will have to address this. So these are typical problems that you will encounter uh, when migrating applications. I see. I guess that probably we do require to do some kind of uh, real-life migration to have more experience on that. 
Um, yeah, okay, yeah. so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, um, it's not as if every code base uh, can be easily migrated to the Java 9 module system. Um, it's just uh, many code bases, um, when they're not developed already with some sort of overarching uh, module uh, boundaries in, in, in mind yet, then um, uh, it's not so much a migration as a re-architecting of your application. And in many cases, that's just not worth it. Um, so I do see the Java 9 module system as being very important for application development, but I wouldn't say that you are going to scramble and migrate all your applications to Java 9 modules um, because that will be a very costly endeavor. And the uh, question is uh, whether you will even be successful in the case of many uh, monolithic uh, code bases that exist currently in Java. So don't see this as the holy grail that every application, every code base should be migrated to. And what about what about new applications? So if you start something yeah. new, yeah, so exactly. So then this is sort of the point that I was working to, but that I forgot to say. Um, if you're starting a new application, then um, um, uh, starting out using the module system is actually uh, very sensible, and it won't uh, uh, require you to re-architect things because you're starting over. And it helps you make the right decisions. It makes you think about, OK, what is my module boundary? Why is this a module boundary? What does it mean? What is my public API? What is what is internal to my API? And these are all things that you should care about and should think about. But the module system now forces you to think about that. And um, I do see that as an important uh, and, and very valuable uh, thought process when developing applications. So definitely, if you're starting something new on Java 9, um, there are not many reasons uh, to not use the, the module system. Uh, because we all know, uh, even though you think your application will be very small, um, things grow. And um, um, for all but the smallest applications, the, the module system really uh, does add value in that sense. OK, so another question here from, from Slack, this is from Balbo. Uh, he's asking, can we map uh, DDD subdomains context into modules? Yeah. Um, that's a tough question. I mean, I, 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 I hear the same question often asked about um, uh, context and microservices. And yeah, it's sort of makes sense to ask this question, uh, but I don't think it, it can be as mechanical as saying, okay, um, this concept from DDD maps to this technical concept in Java, or this concept in DDD maps to uh, this concept in, in microservices, for example. So I think it's at the same level of abstraction. I would agree to that. But I wouldn't necessarily say that everything that you've designed this way using DDD will automatically, in a mechanical way, map to a single module. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, it depends. Yeah, I'm not sure, um, not sure if you have any thoughts about that, uh, Paul. But no, I think I think you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, uh, so what else do we have here? Okay, so this is is mostly like. Uh, uh, continuation, a very similar question, but having a Pojo-based domain module in a Spring Hibernate app, what's the best way to convert uh, to modules architecture? Um, I, yeah, I, I kind of went into that previously. So um, the traditional way of, of splitting up a code base like that is having layers. Um, I think even without modules, you should have, have a, you sh should split up by by feature as well. So uh, don't just put everything in the same interfaces and things like that. Um, so that means think about features and technology and um, put, put those together in, um, in a module. And the smaller these modules are, um, well, of course, to some extent, but usually the smaller those modules are, um, the better. Um, so if you have different types in your in your system um, that that are kind of separate that should definitely be in a, in a module
Yeah, so we have a comment here that I, I senders already talk about this, but I, I guess that we probably need to um, to emphasize it a little more, which is uh, Saif here is concerned about Java 10 coming soon. Uh, and he felt overwhelmed by some of the apps will get stuck because they're not able to migrate to Java 9. So, I mean, Java 9 and Java 9 modularity are two completely different things. So it doesn't, you don't require Java modules or Java 9 modules to migrate to Java 9. So you're definitely able to migrate to Java 9 and migrate to Java 10 and be completely uh, out of modules, right? Yeah, exactly. So like I said previously, there are some gotchas when you move to Java 9 uh, while still using the class path, uh, but they're all fixable. I'm also kind of in a school of thought to um, just rip off that bandage. Um, th there might be some incompatibilities. There might be some some steps to take to uh, get stuff working, uh, but just get it done. Um, I've, I've seen real world uh, companies being stuck on, on like, six-year-old Java versions, and everyone is complaining about it. Nobody likes it, but for some reason, nobody actually take action to um, move to a newer version. That has been true with every single Java version that has been out there. That's, that is nothing true with modules. Yeah. Uh, there are still people on Java 6 today, while it's already unsupported for quite a while now. Um, just, just rip that Band-Aid off. Do the work to uh, migrate to a newer version, including Java 9, and just make it work because it's it is not that hard. Yeah, exactly, and and especially uh, with the new rapid release cycle of Java approaching, I mean, it's it's really something that uh, you you can't wait it out anymore. I mean, things are moving so quickly in a sense, and uh, especially with the module system and and everything that's happened, uh, you could use it, but you don't have to use it. Um, but even if you're not going to use it, there are plenty of other, plenty of other reasons to move to Java 9 uh, from a, uh, a developer productivity perspective, from a performance and security sp perspective, et cetera. So um, there's really uh, not many good reasons to, to, to not upgrade. And like Paul said, uh, you need to take the pain sometime. And uh, why not do it now? Well, I can tell you, uh, uh, if you're not going to do it now, the pain will only get worse. Um, because the warnings, for example, that I talked about, um, when your code uses internal APIs from JDK, well, those might turn into errors in JDK 10 or in JDK 11. Or, I mean, things will be closed closed off more and more. So it's it's better to to act now than to wait even longer because the pain will only increase. Okay, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, Ivan, can uh, please move on? Yeah, there's a question in uh, in Slack from Narendra, and it seems to be on the fourth chapter, services chapter, so I'll try to read it. The service loader seems to be loading based on interface type of service provider interface. Uh, how often does it create an object for the implementation of SPI? Do we need to use a class with provider method to control the lifecycle of the SPI implementation object creation? I think you, you mentioned this in the book, but yeah, can you can you explain here again? How often do we get an right. implementation? Uh, so um, if you don't do if you don't implement anything yourself, every time you do um, a lookup with a server loader, it will create new instances. And as you said in, in chapter four in the book, uh, we actually have some example code that demonstrates that. Um, so if you want something that looks like a singleton, and I know that's kind of a bit of a dirty word, but uh, let's say you want on that behavior, you have to implement it yourself using a provider method. And um, that's super trivial, uh, obviously. Yeah, the other pattern there is that um, what you see in the JDK, for example, is that many service types aren't really the service types that you use directly, but there are factories that you look up. And then, of course, in the factory implementation, you can choose whatever uh, method of creation you want to uh, to use, whether that be uh, singleton or anything else. So you could also implement this in direction yourself, or you could use the provider method approach to uh, to implement that. Okay, I think you you answered the question very well. Thank you. Yeah, please move on with. Uh... A couple of more. I will continue. Uh, and okay, 
still in the services uh, area. Uh, so both of you have a lot of experience with OSGI. Uh, would you please compare the services in Java 9 uh, to the OSGI services? Uh, what can you do with the latter, with OSGI services, that you can't do with the Java 9 services and vice versa? So by far the biggest difference is that services in OSGI are dynamic. And that means that um, at any time during the application runtime, um, services can be registered and deregistered. So they can come and disappear again. Um, that can be a very powerful model because um, based on that dynamic model, um, without restarting an application, you can add new new code, new modules uh, to the system, and um, that code can be can be started and picked up automatically by the application. But it also means that in every code path, basically, that you have where you use services, you have to be prepared for the fact that that service that you depend on might not be there anymore because they can be deregistered. And of course, you can completely ignore that whole concept, but that's kind of setting yourself up for, for failure because at some point you will run into the dynamic nature of the, of the system. Um, so it, it, it has both pros and cons. It's, it's powerful, but it also requires attention. Um, looking at Java services, um, as in Java 9 uh, services, um, these are completely static. So that means um, they will be picked up, they will be registered at startup of the application, but you don't have to think about the um, services being registered or um, being deregistered during runtime. Yeah, another difference is that in OSGI, you can also put some metadata, some properties on services, and you can do lookup based on that. And that's not something that you can do in the Java uh, uh, services system. So well, if you want, you have to model it yourself. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah. That, that, that last <laughs> one was kind of important because yeah, yeah. Um, the, in the service registry in Java 9, you don't have any metadata. So you can't say that there is a difference between different implementations of services, but you can definitely put annotations on top of that, uh, for example, and use the service loader API to filter on those. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> And here we have a continuation question uh, from Narendran, probably not much related, but still interesting. Um, do you guys think that we could replace dependency injection with service providers? It is a question I've been asked um, a lot now, and also a question that I've been asking myself um, many times. Um, when I first started looking at the service loader API, I was like, nah, I don't really like this. I, I kind of like my add inject. And um, I, I just got so used to that whole model uh, by doing that for, for years over years. Um, that it's just hard to, to, to go back to an API into lookups. The more I started using it, though, the more I started to actually like services because it integrates so well with modules. And it turns out that actually that actual injection of, of uh, dependency isn't that important to me anymore. So uh, just looking at me personally, uh, I would be perfectly fine with just using services and the service loader API instead of using dependency injection. On the other hand, um, I know that, I mean, there's so many people being used to dependency injection. That's the, that's, that's the model they know. I don't think, um, at least not not very soon. Um, we will not just throw away all that knowledge and and those habits. And um, maybe it's more habits than uh, than anything else. And just start doing it a different way. So I expect that the penalty injection will be there to stay, which is not a bad thing. It's just maybe making it a little bit harder for yourself than it, than it needs to be. Um, and then finally, you can actually combine services and the penalty injection really well. Um, we actually have a blog post coming up on the O'Reilly website about exactly this topic. So we will combine services and juice and, sh and, and show how that can really, well, kind of make both sides better. Um, and I think that's actually a model that a lot of people should be using in the, in the future. Yeah, there's also a Java One talk, uh, Designing for Modularity, which is uh, on YouTube. And uh, it also touches upon the same topic uh, that the blog post will uh, handle. Cool, I'll search it and I'll share it with, uh, what's the name, sorry? Uh, Designing for Modularity, okay. it's a Java 1 talk from uh, last Java 1, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ivan, can you please proceed? Sure. 
So if we continue to compare OSGI with Java 9 uh, modularity, uh, what I find what I find a little bit confusing with Java 9 is that you export packages but uh, require or import modules. Uh, do you also find it find this confusing because in OSGI you work just with packages? So why do you find it confusing? I'm, I'm rather interested in that. Uh, well, the first time when I when I uh, wrote an, an example with uh, Java 9 modularity, uh, the package name was the same as the module name, uh, and I think this this uh, added to the confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, not not sure why. Maybe because I also have some OSGI background. Uh, time tiny background with OSGI, mm -hmm. where everything was packages and packages. So I'd like to hear your, what, what, what do you think about this? All right. Um, so first of all, in OSGI, you can do both. You can either require packages or, um, or I should say import packages, or you can uh, require um, a bundle, and a module. Um, looking at some of the the largest OGI applications, the Eclipse uh, platform, um, everything is actually requiring requiring at the bundle level, so the module level. Um, but many others in the OGI community, including myself, this was seen as a bad practice because you kind of create a um, a level of coupling that you you might not want uh, because indeed you're only interested in those specific packages that you need, and you can say you don't really care who is providing those packages. So um, from a kind of purist view, um, it, it's weird that you have those different levels of uh, exports and requires. At the same time, um, what I experienced when working on, on OSGI applications is that it's often um, a little bit confusing that um, you're, you know that you need a specific um, package, but you don't really know which module or which bundle uh, provides that. And that makes it more confusing because in many cases, if you're looking at APIs in OSGI, those APIs um, can be provided by multiple different bundles. And then it's hard to, to figure out which of those bundles is actually the one that you're interested in. It becomes even more complicated if you have multiple bundles that you uh, need in your application that all export those, uh, those same packages because then you really don't know which one you're actually using uh, at runtime. So um, although it's a even further level of um, decoupling, you could say, and it gives you some flexibility also when uh, when refactoring, when moving a package from one module to another module, it also adds some, some, some complexity that you have to kind of figure out in your head um, what you're actually using at runtime. So I'm not saying any, I'm not not necessarily necessarily saying that one is better than the other, uh, but there's there's definitely pros and cons to both. Yeah, that's that's basically another thing. Uh, finding the the module that uh, exports a package, uh, maybe maybe we'll get help from IDs, or maybe we even now have help from IDs. I don't know, um, but yeah. Yeah, at yes. least um, uh, IntelliJ and Eclipse. Um, I'm mostly used to IntelliJ, but um, when you start using a class um, from a package and module that you're not, um, um, the ID will tell you, uh, hey, do you want to, um, um, first of all, have an import in your class like you always used to do? And second, do you want to require the other module that provides this, um, this package or exports this package? Yeah. Yeah, so actually this tooling wasn't in place yet when we were writing the book. So we already sort of uh, uh, had an expectation that this would be uh, be implemented. And indeed, both uh, big IDEs, and I think NetBeans does it as well, have, uh, have implemented this feature. So uh, that's really helpful. OK, so there's a question from Duke in, uh, in Slack. Uh, are there already any errata on the book? I think we had one. Um, yeah. I forgot what it is, but I, I remember writing one. 
we forgot a word somewhere and that sort of changed the meaning of uh, a single line in the, the migration chapter i'm not exactly clear on what the line was again but you can look at the uh, o'reilly site and you can view the errata there as well uh, so we could give you a link uh Yvonne, if you want to uh put that somewhere yeah, I was oh, really impressed uh, by when, when I read the first story, Roberto. No, I'm just saying, don't you guys have that information on your uh, well, Java 9 modularity website? Um, the errata is actually on the O'Reilly website. So oh, okay. if you go to the book website on, on O'Reilly, you will find it there. OK, I'll search it and I'll, I'll paste it on the Slack. What I was going to say is that I was really impressed by the, by the quality of the text, uh, in, at least in the first part, which I, which I already read was very well written and without any errors. <laughs> so great, great job, guys. Thank you. Uh, OK. Maybe I can continue, Robert? Uh, yes, please. OK. Uh, so again, some uh, architectural, more, more design question. Uh, would you share the advantages and the uh, implications of putting an implementation of, a, of an exported interface in the same module as the interface mm -hmm. versus putting, it, putting this implementation in a module of its own. So yep. what are, the, what are the, the pros and cons of this approach? Yeah, so the, the approach of putting it into a separate package, which in the book we call API packages, because they only export an API and don't contain an implementation is when you expect there to be multiple implementations. Uh, so if you, for example, have a service provider interface and you expect there to be multiple implementations at some point in time, uh, then it makes sense. And, and why is that? Uh, well, you could also bundle an implementation with this uh, module, but typically this implementation has dependencies on other modules to implement the actual functionality. And what happens then is that if you have a different implementation of the interface that you're exporting, you need to require the module that contains the interface, but it also contains the implementation. And this implementation then brings in transitively its own implementation dependencies. So your alternative uh, implementation um, sort of gets these for free, but you don't want those for free. Maybe you have completely different implementation uh, um, uh, requirements and different implementation dependencies. And uh, if you do not separate the, the API and the implementation, then, uh, then you're forced to, to take, uh, take transitively these dependencies into your application as well. So that will be a downside of combining the interface and the implementation in a uh, in module. On the other hand, uh, if it's self-contained, uh, if it doesn't have this dependency problem, uh, well, then there aren't that many drawbacks to having an uh, implementation inside of the uh, the the, the uh, API module as well. Okay. In some, in some way, this implementation that you bundle with the interface will probably be regarded as the default implementation or the most important implementation. Or so it does have some connotations that may or may not be uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I see a question in, in Slack, but I think you already answered something like this about yeah, it, uh, layers. We already got that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can proceed with the, uh, one from your list. Okay. So uh, I was really surprised. I didn't think about about that before. Uh, if I write a Java application or a Spring application uh, where I expect a library like Hibernate or CDI implementation or Spring uh, to inject some stuff for me or do some kind of magic, uh, should I always open uh, the the packages that I want to be manipulated, or there's there's another way to do it? Um, no, if you have some library or framework um, doing anything that requires deep reflection, which, which for example, you would need for um, uh, dependency injection, um, th then you will need to open it. So I think there's an important um, thing here. You said, um, do I just always open uh, my packages? I think that's that's a bad habit that people could get into. They just by default open all their packages so that the frameworks can do their thing. Um, you should definitely not do that. Um, just open the packages 
that you're sure about that your frameworks need, need to access. And that's usually a lot less than all the packages that you have. So don't get lazy and just open everything because then you're just kind of throwing away um, well, part of, of the encapsulation. Yeah, but if, if we go back to the layers versus uh, feature packages, then most probably in, in most of my feature packages, I would need things like dependency injection, for example. So it makes it all. Well, if, if you use dependency injection um, literally in almost every class that you have in your system, then that would be true. But I don't think that is the case for uh, most real code. Um, if you actually take a good look at um, at, at most real code, um, you don't use dependency injection in every single uh, class role. Uh, probably not. And then, of course, the next thing is uh, why don't you use um, services instead? So everywhere where you are using dependency injection, you could be using services and just avoid this whole problem. OK, Sander, you were going to also answer something. Yeah, no, so actually, Paul already covered this. I wanted to mention services as well as an alternative. <laughs> OK. OK, and here is a question from Bruno. Uh, he's asking, uh, do you guys think that we still need to invent uh, other tools to better manage Java modules? Is Maven on a good track to manage the build of apps with Java 9? No, it's not there yet. I mean. Um, especially Gradle was quite late to the game. Uh, Maven was a bit earlier with supporting at least parts of, uh, of the module system, but we have ways to go there. And um, uh, especially, um, uh, like I said, Gradle is still, uh, I'm not sure whether they actually release something yet, but they only have some experimental support for uh, modules and, and Java 9. Um, so yeah, that will take, take some time as well, still. And that's part of the, the ecosystem still moving toward this uh, this new concept. <laughs> Any word on Ant? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, they had support for, uh, in the uh, Java compiler plugin, they had support quite early already for the uh, module flags, etc. I think so, for uh, Ant, um, the benefit on their side is that you kind of have to configure everything by hand anyways. Exactly, yeah. Um, you can just add those flags that you need, and um, it will just all work. Um, it becomes more complicated if the, the more kind of magic there's going on. So uh, Maven is taking care of a lot of things for you uh, without you seeing it, which means they now have to do new and different things uh, that you don't actually see, but they still have to figure that out. Yeah. So we only have like a couple of minutes left. Ivan, do you have a quick question for uh, for us? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe something on the... Uh, on the licensing part. <laughs> so, ah. <laughs> yeah, I know you're you are not lawyers, but. <laughs> <laughs> so with JLink, I can create stripped uh, Java distributions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, am I able, how, how am I able to distribute them without uh, breaking any license, any licensing or making my code uh, GPL? Yeah. Is that way? Yeah, so it's a good question, and we asked the same question on the mailing list to Mark Reynolds and others, and, uh, and the answer uh, for quite a while was always, yes, of course, it should be possible, but we're not lawyers, and we don't know uh, what exactly will happen yet, uh, licensing-wise. So obviously, we have a release now uh, of uh, Java 9, and if you go to, uh, and I can provide links for that as well, if you go to the uh, actual binary code license, which applies to the, at least the Oracle distribution of the uh, JDK. Uh, then you will see that JLink is uh, exactly uh, is actually mentioned in the license as well as a valid way of creating a distributable uh, that may be redistributed. And like you said, I'm not a lawyer, but to me, when I read that, it reached as an endorsement of just allowing you to create your own distributions and to distribute it further to your users or in the clouds using a Docker image or whatever. And this will be uh, at least in line with what we expected uh, to happen. So uh, again, I can provide links to the actual license so people can read it themselves. And definitely have your legal department check this, and this if you're not really comfortable with my uh, reassurances. But um, yeah, the whole point of this tool was to, to be able to create runtime images 
with your application in it. And it would be very bad if you couldn't do that licensing wise, of course. So I think uh, they got that covered. I think that's the place where you insert a safe harbor slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As always. <laughs> Uh, okay, guys, I think we're pretty much uh, out of time for today. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like to thank um, Paul and Sanders to be here with us uh, for the first uh, session on the Java Modularity book. Also, Ivan to, for helping me out uh, to do these questions to the authors. And uh, for you, uh, audience that uh, came in and uh, watched the session and uh, sent in these awesome questions about Java 9 uh, modularity. So thank, thank you uh, a lot to you guys. And stay tuned that we're going to uh, schedule a second session that's going to cover the rest of the Java 9 modularity book. And we're going to have uh, Paul and Sanders uh, with us again. Uh, so please follow us on Meetup uh, website, and we'll publish the new dates over there. Uh, until then, um, see ya, and have a look into the book and read the rest of the book. So thank you so much, guys. And see you next Thank time. You. Thanks for having us. All right, see you next time.